When it comes to the cost of prescription drugs, the United States is number one, and that's not good. Americans spend more on prescription drugs than any other country, about $2,000 per capita, according to a RAND Corporation study released in 2021. Prescription drug prices in the United States are significantly higher than in other nations, the study noted, averaging two and a half times more than those in the 32 other nations surveyed. A recent report from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, found that more than 9 million adults in this country don't take their medications as directed due to the cost, and that could cause serious health problems. I'm Herb Weisbaum, the Consumer Man, a contributing editor at Checkbook.org. Welcome to Consumerpedia at Checkbook.org. We're the nonprofit that helps consumers select services, avoid trouble, and save money. Because we don't accept any advertising or take money from any business we recommend, you can rely on Checkbook.org to be completely independent and objective. Now, here's the host of Consumerpedia, America's consumer expert, the consumer man, Herb Weisbaum. In this episode, why are drug prices so high in the U.S.? Are pharmaceutical companies the main culprits? Plus, ways you can spend less for your prescription meds. We have two great guests with us today. Lisa Gill, an investigative reporter at Consumer Reports, who focuses on health and insurance. Hi, Herb. And Stacey Dusetzina, a professor in the Department of Health Policy at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Much of her research focuses on the economics related to prescription drugs. Hi, Herb. Both Lisa and Stacy have testified before Congress about the high cost of prescription drugs. I want to set the scene for our discussion with a little bit of what Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders said at a congressional hearing in February. He scolded the pharmaceutical companies for being greedy. The outrageous cost of prescription drugs in America means that one out of four of our people go to the doctor, get a prescription, and they cannot afford to fill that prescription. Meanwhile, as we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, 10 of the top pharmaceutical companies in America made over $110 billion in profits in 2022. They are doing phenomenally well while Americans cannot afford the cost of the medicine they need and the CEOs in general receive exorbitant compensation packages. At that hearing, Senator Sanders provided a price comparison for a few popular prescription drugs. Here's just one example. The annual cost to the blood thinner Eliquis, he said, $7,000 in the U.S., $900 in Canada, and $650 in France. So my first question is the obvious one, and I know there's no simple answer, but let's give it a shot. Why are drug prices so high in the U.S. when compared to the rest of the world? Stacy, we'll start with you. Drug prices are high in the U.S because we allow companies to price their drugs as high as the market will bear. And what that basically means is that they're going to decide the price. And if they have competitors, like other drugs that you could use instead of Eliquis, the drug that you talked about earlier, they have to respond to what their competitors are doing. So there is some negotiation. There are some discounts we see in the U.S., but in general, we don't force companies to give us the best price. And all of our peer nations do. They will negotiate prices based on access to national formularies so they can really obtain much better discounts than we can obtain in the U.S. But part of this is politics and part of this is policy. Some people, Lisa, have said that drug companies set their prices based on whatever the market will bear. Do you agree with that? Correct. You can raise a drug price as high as you want, at least in the commercial market. Drug companies often say the high cost of research and development justifies the high prices they charge. And to be fair, it can cost tens of billions of dollars to bring a new drug to market. But Senator Sanders blames stock buybacks and executive salaries. Your thoughts? Lisa, I'll start with you. There's a fantastic percentage, and I wish I could tell you right off the of my head, it's I, at least a quarter of the R and D, and it's possibly up to a third, if not even higher than that, is actually provided by U.S. taxpayers through the NIH. So a lot of the research that these companies use, it's already been done, at least the basic research. Stacy, I think it is always interesting when we talk about research and development costs and how they contribute to the prices of drugs. Obviously, it is expensive to run clinical trials and to produce new drugs, but. The input prices, the R&D, that doesn't necessarily dictate what price a company is going to get. So, for example, if you spent a ton of money and developed a drug that doesn't work, you probably shouldn't be allowed to price that as high as you want. If you spend a little bit of money and develop a great drug, 
you also shouldn't necessarily be expected to get paid back only what you put in as far as R&D costs. So I always find it a little bit tricky when we talk about how R&D costs contribute to prices. It's almost always used to defend a high price for a not very good drug, but we don't really expect companies to accept low prices if they didn't spend very much to develop a product. So in some countries, there are obviously price controls, which is why the the drugs cost so much less in Mexico and Canada and Europe. I want to go back to the congressional hearing in May, and the CEO of Bristol-Myers Squibb, Chris Borner, said that countries with lower drug prices, in many cases because of those price controls, often have fewer drugs available and longer waits to get treatments. Here's what he told Congress. For example, Canadian patients have access to approximately half of the medicines available in the United States and patients in other countries face a similar reality. Despite its benefits, we know our American system is far from perfect. Patients bear the brunt of a complex U.S. system that results in increasing health care costs and a lack of affordability. We have to make the system work better for them. After all, innovation that does not make it to patients is no innovation at all. Professor Dutzina, your thoughts about that? I think it's really interesting when companies point out how few drugs are available in other countries relative to the U.S., because that's absolutely true. The U.S. has more drugs available. The question I think that is often not answered is how valuable are those drugs that other countries have decided are priced too high to allow them into their market? What I would suggest is that many of the drugs that are not available in those countries are priced too high for the benefits that they bring. There obviously could be some examples of good drugs that aren't in those countries, but by and large, their citizens tend to have access to drugs that are clinically beneficial for the price. The pharmaceutical industry proudly points to the billions of dollars in patient assistance programs it provides each year to people who can't afford to buy their meds. They mentioned that many, many times at this congressional hearing. I guess we applaud them for that. Lisa, do they get some brownie points for doing that? Well, what I can tell you from a consumer standpoint is that when we write stories about how to save money on your medication, we always suggest people check out the patient assistant programs in the event that the drug that they really need is not covered at all by their insurance company. And the truth is, once that happens, a consumer is kind of left empty handed if they really need that specific medication. There will be few options. You won't even be able to use the copay coupon option, for example, that drug manufacturer companies often provide if that drug is not well covered by the insurance. So the patient assistant programs have changed a lot in recent years, and the income threshold was actually pretty low. But over time, it has grown and now it's nearly six figures. You know, you can make $100,000 and still apply for patient assistance. I think it's always worth checking out. You know, it's certainly a good tool that consumers have in their back pocket. Stacy, do we give them a round of applause for doing this? I think we might want to hold our applause just a little bit. I will say from a consumer perspective or when thinking about what you would recommend for an individual person, I always tell people the same thing. Like if you are on a private plan and you have a high deductible and you can't afford your medication, go see if there's a coupon, go see if there's an assistance program. You really want people to have access to their medicines. But from an economics perspective and for thinking about overall health spending, coupons and patients' assistance are a band-aid over a broken leg. So it's not really helping the system, but it helps the individual. It's pretty clear that the pharmaceutical industry blames insurance companies for higher prices. So the question is, what role does the insurance industry play in all this? We'll tackle that next. I'm Herb Weisbaum, and this is Consumerpedia, powered by Checkbook.org. If you like what you hear, we hope you'll consider being a Consumerpedia supporter by using the link at the bottom of the show notes to make a small contribution each month. This is Consumerpedia. Insurance, whether private coverage or through Medicare, can greatly reduce the price you pay for your drugs. Your insurance company hires a third-party administrator called a Pharmacy Benefit Manager, a PBM, to set its formulary. After negotiating prices with the drug companies, the PBM decides which drugs will cost more, which will cost less, and which won't even be covered at all. So let's talk more about how that works. Lisa, give us some more detail on PBMs. So this system is largely driven by rebates, at least on the branded drug side. And what that means is that you may see a very, very high price on the 
what's called like the list price, the public facing price. But drug manufacturers, when they are working among the pharmacy benefit managers, offer discounts on the back end after so-called sales have been made. So they call it a rebate, but it's really a payment. And it is a legal kickback that Congress provided some time ago in order to help drug companies negotiate without a lot of interference. One pharmacy benefit manager won't know what that drug company is offering to another pharmacy benefit manager, for example. So those rebates, the larger the rebate, typically the better covered the drug is by the pharmacy benefit manager, but not always. (laughs) And that's what makes it a little confusing. There are some rebates on the generic side. Uh, They are not nearly as robust or as prominent, but they still can drive a little bit of what that formulary uh, winds up to be. Professor Ducicina, the uh, drug companies say the PBMs get them to charge less, but then don't pass the savings along to consumers in the form of lower prices. So they get those rebates or legal kickbacks, and then they keep most of that. Is that true? I'm not sure we can say with confidence that that's true. One of the huge problems here is that the drug rebate system, the role of the pharmacy benefit manager, and how they interact in the drug supply chain is incredibly opaque on purpose, which basically means no one knows exactly how it works except for the PBMs themselves. What we do know is that pharmacy benefits managers make a lot of money. They probably do take too much money out of the transactions related to prescription drugs. But in theory, they're supposed to be working on behalf of the plan to lower spending, even for a drug that's highly rebated. So where Lisa was describing that they provide a rebate after the sale. What PBMs will say is that they use that money to keep premiums from going up more than they would without those dollars. The problem is, is we just don't know how all of that money flows through the system. And that is a key problem today. And I'd like to add one thing to this conversation that to at least help us think a little even beyond what you've asked, Herb, and that is, I have always been very moved by some of the companies like Costco and Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Drugs that price out drugs based on literally the actual cost and not the list price. What you can see clearly is that, you know, not all drugs, but a lot of drugs, like some of the most commonly used ones are extremely cheap. And Costco has talked to me numerous times telling us that, you know, one of the reasons that when we do secret shopper efforts and that we see these really, really low prices at Costco is because the company doesn't allow Costco to price and make a profit over about 3%. So it means that their generic drugs are going to be rock bottom prices. There was kind of the first signal to us many years ago when we began that kind of investigation that there was something seriously wrong with the entire drug pricing system. So it sounds to me like the middle people are the ones that are making a lot of money out of this considering what Mark Cuban is doing and what Costco is doing. That's right. It's When we look at the pricing for a lot of very commonly used generic drugs, and then you compare that to pricing offered at other places, those two places deliberately price them just barely above the actual price, not the list price, but the actual price that they pay. Lisa, in your extensive coverage of the issue for Consumer Reports, you've written that pharmaceutical companies often pay the PBM to favor some of their drugs in that formulary by putting them in a lower price tier, which means a smaller copay for me, the consumer, to boost sales. Could that explain why the generic drug that I've taken for years and I always paid $12 for for a 90-day refill all of a sudden jumped to 122 bucks? So they changed the formulary to favor a brand name drug that they wanted to push? Well, that's exactly what happened. I think you, you've turned into the expert too, or that's 100% what happened. So that formulary is based on not necessarily what's best for the patient or what makes rational economic sense. It's based on what makes sense for the business. And for the business, it sounds like they would have gotten a pretty hefty legal kickback, a rebate to favor a more expensive drug in order to steer everybody toward that drug, they make it so that that generic is suddenly like exorbitantly priced. In August, the Biden administration announced that it had done the first negotiations for 10 drugs that a lot of seniors take. First time the federal government for Medicare has negotiated lower drug prices. It doesn't kick in until 2026, but do you think this will have any impact at all on the overall pricing of drugs in this country? I'm not sure how much spillover effect it will have for people outside of Medicare. But it is a step forward that the government is able to negotiate the price for some older drugs. 
And based on their calculations, they suggest that they're able to save some money relative to what the pharmacy benefits managers and plans are doing on Medicare today. So I think overall, it's a good news story for Medicare beneficiaries. Unclear how much it's going to benefit people outside of Medicare. So up next, how to pay less for your prescription drugs. There really are things you can do. I'm Herb Weisbaum, the Consumer Man, and this is Consumerpedia, powered by Checkbook.org. Consumerpedia Fast Facts According to the CDC, prescription drug use increased with age, from 18% of children under age 12 years to 85% of adults age 60 and over. The rheumatoid arthritis drug Humira is the world's top medication based on revenue according to Statista. And here's a fun fact from Texas Tech University's School of Pharmacy. The oldest known prescriptions were recorded on clay tablet in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, around 2400 BC. The ingredients included mustard, fig, myrrh, bat droppings, turtle shell powder, river silt, snake skins, and hair from the stomach of a cow dissolved into wine, beer, or milk. Yum! I found a simple way to cut the cost of my family's prescription drugs. For certain refills, we skip the insurance, download a coupon from the website GoodRx, and pay with cash. I know it sounds crazy, but by doing this, we're saving nearly $1,000 a year. Could you f two please explain to me what's going on here? Why am I paying for health insurance, in my case, Medicare, and getting significantly lower prices for medicines by not using it? Stacy, I'll start with you. Yeah, this is one of the most frustrating things in our prescription drug supply chain and in this space is how you can be asked to pay so much more money under your health plan than you would be asked to pay when you pay cash. This is really a tale of generic drugs versus brand name drugs. So most of the time, if you're filling a brand name drug, you're going to be better off using your health insurance if it's covered under your plan. But for generic drugs, there's a lot of gaming going on in the system where maybe the pharmacy benefits manager has made some decisions about how to cover drugs in a way that makes a drug that should be cheap more expensive to you, the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is really a function of the generic market a function of the lack of clarity that we have into how much our plans are paying for drugs. And it's something that needs to be fixed urgently. And by the way, for that drug of mine, the generic that went from 12 bucks to 122 bucks by using a coupon, I got it back down to about $10, $12 again. So it really is something that can save you money. Yeah, there's a really good example of a cancer drug that has been available for the last year or two through Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Drugs for about 40 dollars. And we've done some research and shown that if you were filling it on Medicare Part D, your plan could be paying literally thousands of dollars per fill. And you as the beneficiary could be paying hundreds of dollars per fill when you could get it for super cheap elsewhere. One thing I just want to quickly point out is that the Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drugs doesn't accept any insurance. And, I, and the cancer drug is a great example. And so is your experience. These are two huge symptoms of a major problem with how we regulate and insure medications in this country. And when you know we see sort of these, what seem at first like an outlier, but then you realize, no, it is actually the root of the problem. And this is sort of what Cost Plus Drugs has, and, and Costco too, tried to demonstrate through their pricing is that insurance companies, there's so much going on in the back rooms and the accounting where they mark up one thing, they reduce the cost of something else. It's really to corral people to make decisions that seemingly benefit them, but also benefit the company. It's, it's just outrageous. And, and you said it earlier, what is the point of having drug coverage if it doesn't always really serve you? Or if you have to be constantly in a vigilant state about, well, am I actually getting the best deal? By the way, there are a number of websites that now offer discount coupons, including GoodRx. There's America's Pharmacy, Blink Health, Optum Perks, Single Care, Rx Saver, which is by Retail Me Not, and Well Rx. And depending on the drug and where you live, you can typically pay 50 to 80% less than the full cash price, which, as I said, may be cheaper than what you pay with insurance. So, Lisa, how do these coupon companies do this? How do they get such low prices? I mean, they get fees from drug manufacturers. I mean, they, they receive fees. They also make money off of 
selling some uh, de-identified information about people that may have even visited the website, even if you don't put in your name and your information. So these companies are basically stepping in as an intermediary. The GoodRx has told me many times is that it's basically a micro fee structure. So they don't receive a lot of money per coupon. It's with a lot of people using them. Coupon companies don't make anything, anything close to what a pharmacy benefit manager does and certainly nothing near what a health insurance company does. Privacy is very important before you use one of these apps or websites. Check its privacy policy to make sure you're comfortable with the type of data it collects and how it might use that. The amount of information collected and sold to other companies really does vary from site to site. And you got to keep in mind, Stacy, that paying with cash, you don't start any way with your annual deductibles. So you need to do the math and see which way makes sense. Basically depends on how many drugs you're taking and, and what kind of uh, money you're going to be spending that year. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And this is not a calculation most people are that excited to be doing. But sometimes you're better off using your health insurance benefit if, for example, you think you're going to hit your out-of-pocket maximum, because eventually that means that you won't have to pay as much through deductibles or through out-of-pocket costs. But for most consumers, it's probably going to be the case that if they're filling one prescription drug, for example, or a generic drug, they're probably better off shopping around and looking for those discounts and coupons. No matter where you shop, Consumer Reports recommends asking your pharmacist, what is the lowest possible price you can give me? And is there a cheaper price if I don't use my insurance? You know, Lisa, that's what my wife did recently at Costco. We actually got a lower price than the Costco price. It was pretty amazing. Well, Herb, I am not at all surprised to hear that you would get a lower prescription drug price by not using your insurance. In the 10 plus years that we've been investigating this very issue, it used to be, I would say, uncommon for that to happen, but it is increasingly common. What's crazy is, you know, I work on the consumer side, so our advice is always really to prompt people to have that conversation with their pharmacist at the pharmacy counter and to arm them with a few questions. And it always was, you know, hey, pharmacist, is there a lower possible price? In terms of what's going on there, You know, we talked about it earlier, but pharmacy benefit managers, as they put these formularies together, are basically corralling people towards one decision and away from another decision. And when you start to see drugs that used to be very well covered, that, you know, cost you just a couple bucks out of pocket, all of a sudden shoot up and they're really, they're a lot less affordable. It's because something else is going on in the background. The pharmacy benefit manager and your insurer want you to pick something else. You know, you find out this as you're standing there at the counter and all of a sudden, you know, the pharmacist is like, hey, it's actually like 10 bucks for three months. You don't even need the insurance. And all of a sudden you're like, this system makes no sense. I don't have a great answer except to say, ask to see if there's a lower possible price. Ask, you know, what happens if I don't use my insurance? Is there some other way to pay for it? So you're saying there could be a lower cash price that the pharmacist can't or doesn't tell you about unless you specifically ask. Well, it used to be the case that they couldn't even offer it, or, le- or at least they interpreted the contract language as disallowing a pharmacist from offering a lower cash price. And so we had prompted consumers to just ask. So if, if a consumer asked, then the pharmacist could offer it. Gag clauses are illegal now. So it always should be the case that a pharmacist just on their own offers. But it's still a good advice, especially if you're tightly budgeted and, and that prescription might be like pushing you over the edge or, or you're just price sensitive or just heck, nobody wants to pay more than they need to for something. You should really ask. And I have to say, I acknowledge how ridiculous this sounds because there's really no other consumer product I can think of where you have to go, you know, you go to the counter and say, hey, can I get a better price on those tissues or this greeting card? You don't negotiate on anything else. But for some reason with prescription drugs and the way our system is so convoluted and not necessarily always in patient's favor, it benefits you asking and intervening a little bit on your own behalf. And CR also recommends checking with independent mom and pop pharmacies if there's one where you live because they have greater leeway and may actually offer you a better price. Yeah, they have a lot more pricing leeway. So, you know, chain pharmacies and pharmacists at those chains can't individually change the price of a drug. But at mom and pop independently owned pharmacies, they have a lot more pricing leverage. And in many cases, they will tell you that they will meet or beat price competitors. If you you show them like, hey, I I can get this cheaper somewhere else. Of course, they want to keep your business and they don't want to overcharge you. Um, And at the same time, part of the beauty of the independent is that they can adjust their pricing based on your needs. Stacey, before we let you go, any thoughts you have, suggestions for ways people can save money on their prescription drugs? I'll piggyback on a lot of things that Lisa has suggested. 
you know, one of the big ones for me is if a person has a branded prescription that they can't afford, sometimes that's because their formulary doesn't cover that particular product and they might cover a different one. So another tip would be to talk with your doctor or pharmacist about whether or not the drug that is being ordered could be substituted with something else that is equally beneficial, but that is on your formulary. Aside from that, I think Lisa is exactly right. You have to do some comparison shopping. You should always ask the people at the pharmacy counter if you can't afford your drug. I've personally had an example where there was a drug that I was prescribed. It wasn't covered on my formulary and the pharmacist helpfully offered, well, if I took these two low cost over the counter drugs, it would do the same thing and saved me 500 bucks right there. Mm. Wow. So I think that there are always options available for people. Just asking people if you can't afford something is the very first, most basic step. And hopefully they can help you afford something to take care of the clinical issue you need to have treated. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. We want to thank our great guest, Lisa Gill from Consumer Reports. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me on. It's a really a pleasure to talk to you both. And Professor Stacy Dusazina from Vanderbilt University. Thank you very much. We have other Consumer PD episodes that deal with medical issues. Here are two you might want to check out. Number 22, How to Find a Top Doc. And number 66, Cutting Through the Nutritional Supplements Hype. And that's it for this episode. Remember, we release new ones every other Thursday. If you like what you heard, we hope you'll rate the episode and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Another way you can support this show is to follow us on Consumerpedia on Facebook and Instagram and at My Consumerpedia on X, formerly Twitter. I'm Herb Weisbaum. Thanks for listening. Consumerpedia is a public service of Checkbook.org. We're a unique nonprofit that helps you save money and make smarter choices. You can count on Checkbook to help you find the best services and avoid the worst with local ratings that are accurate and unbiased. If you live in or around these seven cities and haven't joined Checkbook yet, check us out. Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, Seattle, San Francisco, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Washington, D.C. To get your free 30-day subscription, go to checkbook.org slash consumerpedia. If you like what you've heard, we hope you'll become a supporter by using the link at the bottom of the show notes to make a small contribution each month. Consumerpedia, empowering consumers to save money and make smarter choices.